News. 9.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake. 89.3 Lakes FM. It's the Megacast, an hour-long TV and radio streaming show keeping you informed on the day-to-day -day news. Live from West Bloomfield, we're bringing you the news, updates, and information impacting communities around Michigan. Join our host, Tyler Keeft, as he talks with community members, business leaders, and professional experts about the stories that impact you. You're watching the Megacast on Civic Center TV. When the temperatures are chilly, being together warms the soul. <laughs> Keep the winter fun going. Help protect yourself and those around you by keeping your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. One in four Michigan homes has high levels of radon, a naturally occurring radioactive gas known to cause lung cancer. It doesn't matter where you live or what type of home you have. You won't even know it's there unless you test. So don't wait. Testing is cheap and easy. And if there's a problem, it's simple to fix. Visit michigan.gov slash radon to learn more. We took action, will you? WB Parks and the West Bloomfield Diversity Task Force once again invite you to the 2023 Black Expo. Drop by Orchard Mall and tour demos and displays that highlight black business owners, resources, and careers. Bring your friends and family to shop around local vendors and support their hard work and dedication to their craft. Come on down Saturday, February 25th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Orchard Mall in West Bloomfield. The 2023 Black Expo. Hello, nose. My nose knows is when somebody uses the bathroom. Mom, all I did is flush. Ooh, I smell cookies. I smell an A+. Plus. How could my nose be running when it stays on my face? Our noses know if those sniffles are just a cold, allergies, or COVID-19. So swab it. Test it. It's good to know. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. You're listening to your radio homes for the Megacast, 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake and 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. Today's edition of the Megacast begins now. Welcome to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. Today we'll be talking to a number of people about topics of interest and importance to Michiganders just like you. Let's begin with what's making headlines today on our website on civiccentertv.com. Just click on our local news page and follow along or read these articles later on and all the supporting materials from great journalists all across our local area. Our top story comes from Frank Witzel and Brian Manzullo at the Detroit Free Press. Following yesterday's ice storm, nearly half a million homes are out of power this morning. DTE's power outage map, which you can find a link to on our website at civiccentertv.com slash ice, shows over 485,000 customers. Power is down at this time, or roughly 22% of DTE's coverage area. That's the bulk of Michigan's 495,403 customers that are without power as of this morning. And things may actually get a little bit worse before they get better or at best will putter a little bit in their recovery as high winds are expected in the forecast for Thursday. At this time, DTE has 1,500 line workers out and about in the local community, uh, troubleshooting any outages and, and other problems that may have amounted from the from the ice on the infrastructure on, on power lines that may have impacted transformers whatever reason for these outages those crews are out right now actively working 
on restoring power or troubleshooting any of those issues that may have arisen uh, beyond a simple power outage at this time. The same thing goes for Consumers Energy with 85 of their crews out and about working on those outages as well. Official ice accumulation from yesterday's storm from the National Weather Service puts Oakland County at about a quarter of an inch of ice right in that low end that was expected for this storm, which, which forecast anywhere from a quarter to a half an inch of ice accumulation across the board from 12 noon yesterday to 4 a.m. This morning, Oakland County getting a, a large sum of that at a quarter of an inch in comparison to other areas surrounding southeastern Michigan. So roads will be slick again today despite temperatures in the 40s and wind gusts of up to 40 miles per hour, as we mentioned, may cause additional power outages. So again, keep yourself prepared and stick with us on our website on our civiccentertv.com slash ice page for more information on the aftermath of this ice storm and the day after, which may cause some additional issues or headaches along the way. Despite the temperatures being pretty high today, they're going to be in about the 40s. Uh, that will uh, top out uh, at about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon today. Despite those temperatures and the expected melting of a lot of the slush and ice that is out there, uh, it's not going to be the end of all this. Those roads are still going to be slick. There may be some flooding, additional power outages due to the wind. Whenever you have those major changes from lower temperatures to moderate temperatures, certainly low temperatures to high temperatures, there's a lot of wind that's involved. Severe weather is more, uh, it's more likely. And in this case, it's going to be the wind on this Thursday that will have the biggest impact weather-wise outdoors on your commute and certainly on your home and your office's power today. So be prepared with whatever provisions you may need in case of a power outage or an extended power outage from yesterday into today. Even I lost power a couple of times last night uh, around 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Uh, as the storm progressed and the ice really was starting to accumulate overnight with those lower temperatures. Today, the melting may help with some of those uh, frozen lines that have caused some power outages. Maybe that restores power altogether without intervention from DTE or consumers, but expect those power outages to either continue through this day because of the wind, or maybe you've had your power restored that went out yesterday because of the winds early on in the storm. We knew that we know that that happened in our local area around our flagship studio here at Civic Center TV in West Bloomfield. That might happen again today, so don't, don't put your generators away just yet. Uh, make sure you're still prepared to uh, run them if your power does go out again or, or that you have enough food and, and water to get through a, a couple of days, a few days here potentially, should your power go out again and stay out for an extended period of time. Stay with us, civiccentertv.com slash ice for helpful information as well as links to DTE's outage map so you can see what's going on in your area, what, how power outages are affecting your hometown, your office, surrounding areas you may need to go on this Thursday, as well as information on how you can report a power outage too if you experience one today and it has not shown up on that map yet. It's a good way to let DTE know, hey, something's going on in this area. You might want to look into it, especially as they accumulate more of those reported in your general area each and every day. Also making headlines today on our local news page on civiccentertv.com, this time from Bridge, Michigan's U, Stella U. Michigan State University, along with the Associated Students of MSU, or ASMSU, the student government, held a town hall meeting on campus yesterday at Bessie Hall, just across from the MSU Rock, to discuss campus safety and hear from students' stories of the night of the mass shooting on February 13th, as well as what they would like to see the university do in the aftermath of the event that killed three students and, live, and leaves five students currently hospitalized at this time. Uh, the conversation was led among those, including interim university president, Dr. Teresa Woodruff, uh, MSU uh, chief of police and vice president of public safety, Marlon Lynch, as well as the, uh, uh, president, the undergraduate president of ASMSU, uh, Joe Kovach. At the town hall, students had several demands that they made uh, as they were exclaiming their stories from the day of the event as well as in the days following. Those demands included upping security on campus and implementing greater measures to prevent entry into university buildings or, in, or at least into classrooms, uh, which uh, was pretty easy access on Monday of, uh, of that shooting uh, for the uh, eventual shooter to get into these classrooms and therefore be able to kill three students and put five additional students into the hospital. So greater security measures being asked for 
by the students of, of Michigan State University. In addition, students criticized the university's decision to return to class on Monday of this week, and another student provided a perspective, actually, that was interesting. We haven't he really heard too much of that in the wake of last week's shooting, as Madeline Toko uh, had argued that the university needs to provide better accommodations in their buildings for students with disabilities in order for them to hide and shelter in place should that need present itself. And in our modern day, it, it, that's a consideration that absolutely should be made, that all should be accommodated in their classrooms in these buildings uh, at public schools, especially in universities, high schools, that uh, these events have happened several times in the past in order to make sure that everybody, regardless of uh, if they are an, an, a, a quote unquote able-bodied or if they are disabled, are able to then shelter in place and keep themselves safe, expressing uh, concerns, as she me mentioned this yesterday uh, at this town hall, that you know, we shouldn't have to worry about our friends because they're disabled while they're right there in our classroom and we're safely hiding ourselves. They should be able to have their own places as well that are designated. In all, it was a good, a good way for the university to gauge the students' stance on the status of the campus and their security and an outlet for students to voice their frustrations with the current operations in the wake of the on-campus tragedy and where they'd like to see the university go from here. Finally, making headlines today on our local news page from Chandra, from Chandra Fleming at the Detroit Free Press. The state of Michigan's Health and Human Services Department this week announced it added 6,547 COVID-19 cases and an additional 89 deaths to its toll, putting the caseload for the past seven days at an average of 935 cases per day. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic ne nearly three years ago, Michigan has accumulated 3,049,739 COVID-19 cases and 41,957 deaths. That is as of the MDHHS's most current count on Tuesday of this week. All those headlines are making news on our local news page on civiccentertv.com, along with links at the top of the page to COVID-19 information directly from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and locally from the Oakland County Health Division. We have a great show ahead on this Thursday edition of the Megacast. Stay tuned. Coming up next, we'll have our weekly mental health talk with Carrie Craywick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic. That's next on the Megacast. Hello, nose. My nose knows is when somebody uses the bathroom. Mom, go in and flush. Ooh, I smell cookies. I smell an A+. Plus. How could my nose be running when it stays on my face? Our noses know if those sniffles are just a cold, allergies, or COVID-19. So swab it. Test it. It's good to know. WB Parks and the West Bloomfield Diversity Task Force once again invite you to the 2023 Black Expo. Drop by Orchard Mall and tour demos and displays that highlight black business owners, resources, and careers. Bring your friends and family to shop around local vendors and support their hard work and dedication to their craft. Come on down Saturday, February 25th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Orchard Mall in West Bloomfield. The 2023 Black Expo. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. You can learn more about our program on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll also find information on all of our partnering stations, including those in your local area here in Oakland County and across the state of Michigan, if you're joining us on My Michigan TV. Joining us now on the program for our weekly mental health conversation is Carrie Krawick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic. Carrie, thank you as always for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, glad to have you on to talk about uh, what's coming up next week. Monday, February 27th marks the beginning of Eating Disorders Awareness Week, a campaign to educate the public about the realities of eating disorders and, and how they manifest, how they are 
uh, treated and ultimately how the recovery from them goes for these individuals that, uh, and it happens to people all across the board in all different walks of life, uh, but there's still even today as we put more of a focus on mental health and the stigma across the board for mental health has kind of been diminished to some extent, that hasn't exactly been the same for eating disorders. So how, do, how does that factor in to people coming forward and, and, and ultimately you know, treating those eating disorders when you know, that, that stigma is still kind of there and that denial is really well set in place in some cases? Absolutely. I mean, eating disorders, um, it's important this week to give them attention. And even a simple Google search will first take you to anorexia, which is the most well known of eating disorders, um, but not the most common. So when most people think of eating disorders, they think of those very severely thin people and they think of the very um, severe restrictions. Um, but but what, what isn't necessarily um, considered is that how many people are actually suffering from other forms of disordered eating. Um, and it's really an opportunity to bring attention to um, all the ways in which our healthy eating dis uh, behaviors impact our, our health and our family. Eating disorders are among the most lethal of mental health conditions. And, and as we mentioned, these are disorders that affect people across a variety of different backgrounds and, and different demographics, but it's typically kind of seen, it's stereotypically seen as more of a, a quote unquote women's issue, but it affects more than just women. It affects men, it affects uh, women of various ages, men of different age, ages. So just how much of a broad, a broad scope of people do eating disorders tend to affect? Absolutely, every every race, age, culture, ethnicity is affected by eating disorders. And actually, um, interestingly, um, westernization of, of people who've come and immigrated from other countries and then come here are a population that's at increasing risk um, for a variety of reasons. So among eating disorder, among all eating disorders, um, often things start out perhaps sort of innocently, maybe an attempt at health or dieting, maybe as a response to stress or change. Um, and then what happens is that they um, evolve and, and kind of avalanche over time into more and more problematic behavior. Um, but we are seeing them across every population. What's interesting with the science is that there are some common factors. So even though a person's um, habits may be different than one other or another, but yet they might still be diagnosed with the same eating disorder, what we're noticing is some common themes. So some social themes like bullying or some, you know, family history of idealization of certain body weights or types, um, family history and biological contributors such as like a first degree relative having an eating disorder themselves or um, you know that would be like a sibling or a parent um, and also you know a first degree relative having another mental health condition like anxiety or depression those might also play a role um, so we're seeing like biologic factors across all eating disorders we're seeing social factors um, psychological factors such as perfectionism and anxiety and rigidity rigidity excuse me, um, that also play a role. So even though eating disorders look different amongst people and it is not always um, that, that extremely thin way it manifests, but we are seeing some common themes across all people with eating disorders. We're joined on the program today by Carrie Craywick, a therapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. You can find more information on the website at BirminghamMaple.com. BirminghamMaple.com to get in contact with Carrie and the professionals there at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. And uh, in, in terms of how these, how a treatment would, would manifest itself, typically, how are those patients that are afflicted with a, an eating disorder ultimately getting into contact with professionals like yourself or others at the Birmingham Maple Clinic or other mental health uh, facilities or practices? Sure. I mean, in some ways, unfortunately, still takes a lot of time because initially um, it can be concealed, right? Someone may say, oh, I've become a vegan. But if you're only eating romaine lettuce, that's not really healthy veganism. That's something else. But it can sort of go on for a long while um, before people say, wow, this really has arrived at a time where I'm concerned for you or a person to say, for example, concerned um, for themselves. And um, so it can take time. But the, the most appropriate treatment is a combination. It includes includes both nutritional counseling and, and the development of healthy um, eating behaviors and habits, um, medical counseling and supervision of a doctor to make sure because a lot of body functions are involved. Um, and then also um, talk therapy, group therapy or family therapy to address some of the underlying causes. 
And these are issues that are multifactorial. They, they, they often require treatment from not just mental health professionals, but those uh, in, in other medical professions a, as well. Uh, we recently talked to uh, another professional that, that, uh, about eating disorders a few months ago that was able to e explain this to us. But from your perspective as a mental health professional, how are you consulting with other doctors that, that a patient may be seeing uh, in order to uh, conduct a treatment on the mental health side for an, an eating disorder that is right for one patient versus another, given that these circumstances, these individuals are so va varying across the board when it comes to eating disorders? Sure, when that information is more well known, it's absolutely imperative that uh, therapists and professionals that are trained specifically in eating disorders, um, they recognize the signs and symptoms and they, they um, uh, therapists, psychologists and other mental health professionals that work in the eating disorder community are usually well connected to those other professionals. There's a network of nutritionists, dietitians and doctors who are all really on the same page and can provide systematic care, whether that's outpatient or inpatient or, you know, what's called day treatment. So like a program where you go, you know, from say nine to three or nine to five and then return to your home uh, for the evening. Um, but it really, it really is the best treated, you know, in a, in a, in a, with a whole, with a whole network. I'm joined by Carrie Krawick on today's edition of the Megacast, a therapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. You can find them online on Birmingham Maple dot com and, and beyond the treatment there's also factors outside uh, of of uh, treatment that also contribute to the success of the recovery certainly relationships with family and and friends and, and being able to monitor and and manage some of those triggers that may lead to uh, exacerbating your eating disorder on a personal level so how much of an impact can those friends and those families and the ways that they behave towards someone that may have an eating disorder ultimately impact the way that they recover, but also the way that they're triggered and, and ultimately leading into some of these eating disorders. Sure, I think, you know, like it could be very helpful to have family therapy or to even have other family fam family members in individual therapy to understand their own thoughts, guilt, feelings, things associated um, with body, what, body weight, dieting, body shape, um, you know, cultural things, trauma, um, definitely understanding, even, even like said, anxiety and depression, the way in which your moods and emotions may impact another member of your household can be very informative and help prevent, like you said, the cycles or even um, codependency and enabling that might happen in families when one person person um, is responding to the moods and emotions of somebody else. More information and, and ways to get in contact with the Birmingham Maple Clinic can be found on their website, birminghammaple.com. You can also call them at 248-646-6659. And, and in terms of that treatment, how typically or, or what, what typically would be experienced it between um, a, a therapist or another mental health professional and someone with an eating disorder to bring that treatment along and, and begin that recovery process that's all often quite complicated. So, so like most things, um, you know, any medical condition or mental health condition, the intensity and of the symptoms, the severity of the symptoms at the time are going to help to guide the severity of the treatment that for some um, starting tr treatment initially, you know, might mean um, that outpatient is sufficient for other people where the behaviors are um, very deeply ingrained and the symptoms are very severe or even medically um, emergent, um, the treatment would be more intensive. Um, and so that would be guided by, you know, the information you're getting at the time, certainly an exploration of the history of the behaviors, the history of trauma, the history of the family, the history of other mental health conditions, um, the history of other treatment or treatment episodes would all guide um, sort of what intervention takes place immediately after assessment uh, and eating disorders they're, they're extremely dangerous they are deadly they they can have a number of different health effects beyond the mental health uh, effects on an individual and especially on children uh, uh, because they're going through their development both physically both physically their bodies but also their brains too so these can have immense impacts on kids so what should parents be doing to check in with their child or uh, to at least be able to maybe clock that their child may be uh, in the pre-stages of an eating disorder or at risk to develop one 
Sure. I mean, as parents, you know, modifying the way in which you talk about your own body and the way you talk about your child's body or other people's bodies in general is going to be one way offering corrections um, or helpful reminders if, if someone is talking about their body in a critiquing way or fantasizing about their body looking in some way different because certainly having a disordered body image and a disordered body ideal are two of those common factors. Certainly in a household, limiting any bullying between siblings and being aware of bullying, especially bullying about a person's body that's happening outside of the home um, and making interventions you know, with the school as needed or certainly um, helping to coach your own child how to cope with those feelings would help. Again, you know, especially since most of them start in adolescence, just being, you know, aware, supervising what, you know, you can't, you're not with your child perhaps for every meal they eat. But again, if you notice some change in behaviors and, you know, someone's all of a sudden switched to, you know, I'm only eating organic, but then it becomes more and more restrictive or I'm intermittent fasting, but then the, the time of eating never arrives. You know, we have all these sort of code words now, you know, like I said, it's vegan or keto or whatever, and they're sort of under the guise of health. But what happens is when someone uses those words to conceal some behaviors becoming more and more and more restrictive. So just kind of trying to clock that and, and gain some understanding with curiosity and compassion. Okay, like I know you've taken this vegan approach and how are you going to do it in the most healthy way possible? And in, in terms of monitoring these symptoms and these behaviors, both for parents as well as for individuals uh, themselves or the friends, their family, their colleagues, uh, when is it? When is a time or when should there be that conversation about seeking mental health assistance uh, in treating an eating disorder or going and getting formally diagnosed by another medical professional as well? Sure, I think, um, you know, like one rule of thumb is always when when a person's behavior matches what they say they want. So if you're talking to your friend or family and they're saying, you know, I want to be healthy, but their behavior is not in line with health, then certainly reflecting that back to them. There's, there's disparity there. There's incongruence there. This thing that you're saying does not match with the thing that you're doing. Um, and then that would be certainly an impetus for change. More information and ways to get in contact with the Birmingham Maple Clinic can be found on BirminghamMaple.com. You can also send them an email, info at BirminghamMaple.com, or call them 248-646-6659, 248-646-6659 for more information. Carrie, uh, as we are approaching the beginning of Eating Disorders Awareness Week, uh, and, we, and we've had an extensive conversation about eating disorders. Anything else that we haven't discussed yet today that would be important for our audience to be considering about eating disorders, about treatment, uh, about looking for symptoms or anything else that we have not uh, discussed yet? Sure. Again, like I said, you know, it often gets the most attention. The restrictive eating gets the most attention. And perhaps there's some sensitivity in confronting someone about binge eating or overeating and those behaviors. Um, but certainly that's an area where more Americans are uh, uh, facing e disordered eating and, and the psychological and physical health. Another thing that I think is interesting that's only getting just a little bit of attention is the abuse of um, diabetes-related drugs and or the misuse of insulin, um, that people are, are using those things to affect their body weight. And this is something that's fairly new and only now just getting research um, and, and isn't even fully understood yet as how it relates to the eating disorder community. So something to come on this topic in the future. You can get in contact with Carrie and the other professionals at the Birmingham Maple Clinic on their website, Birmingham Maple dot com or 248-646-6659. Carrie, thank you as always for joining us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate having you on. We'll take a break on the Megacast. And on the other side, Robert Boyle will join us from the Furniture Bank of Southeastern Michigan. Stay tuned. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. There are many different kinds of noses. Our noses can sniff out all kinds of things. Good things bad things. Your nose knows if those sniffles are just a cold, allergies, or COVID-19. So swab it. Test it. It's good to know. I'm Steve Eisenman of the Detroit Red Wings, and I think every child in Michigan deserves a safe, healthy and happy childhood. Can we build a state where children trust Michigan isn't just a name, but something our kids believe? Please support Children Trust Michigan as the voice for children and families 
by visiting the website to learn more. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Welcome back to Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. Stay up to date with us and find all of our full shows and each individual interview segment on demand on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. In addition, given the ice storm yesterday and the continued effects today, we'll have updated information to help keep you safe and informed on what's going on in relation to winter storm Olive that affected us yesterday and continues to have an effect today on our website at civiccentertv.com slash ice. Well, whether you're moving from one location to another or it's just time to say goodbye to some of your old furniture, it plays a big role in making your living space home and providing comfort and quality rest at the end of your day. But for some individuals, they're not able to uh, obtain that, that sort of necessity for when they're, for when they're moving or they, they encounter some sort of disaster or other factors that lead to losing that furniture and not being able to have those comforts that are so impactful on our day-to-day -day life. When that happens, one organization known as the Furniture Bank of Southeastern Michigan helps to intervene and provide these individuals and families with some of these necessities that we often take for granted. Joining us now from the Furniture Bank of Southeastern Michigan is their executive director, Robert Boyle. Robert, thanks for being with us today. Tyler, great to be with you. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, glad to have you on because uh, it, this is an issue that is never ending. It's unfortunate in our society, but uh, the, these individuals and these families are in need of, of some help and assistance from organizations like yours and those in the community to provide some of these necessities. So in southeastern Michigan, how much of an issue really is it or how great of an issue really is it? For, uh, in terms of having families you know, not have the furniture, those beds, and, and, and so on in particular, that they need to live a, a normal and comfortable and well-rested life on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, well, you know, Tyler, when folks think of basic needs, uh, you know, generally it, it, they think of food, clothing, and shelter. Um, but if you don't have a bed to sleep in every night, as you alluded to just a moment ago, or if you don't have a table around which you can gather for a meal with your family or furniture to just sit on with your children, watch a little television, um, you're, you're not living with the stability and dignity um, you know, that most of us take for granted. Uh, last year, the Furniture Bank helped 2,300 families or almost 7,000 folks in total. And we distributed about 18,500 items valued at over a million dollars. Um, and that's about a 20% increase from um, the previous year, uh, 2021. Um, so it's it's a huge problem. I mean, 90% of the families that we have uh, referred to us have household incomes of $20,000 or less. On average, there are three people in a household. So if you've got a single parent and two kiddos, um, you know that's not to go a lot to go on. So while you're trying to make your rent and pay for your groceries and and meet with your utility or meet your utility and travel expenses. Affording furniture is just really a challenge for a lot of people, and that's why we're here. And, uh, and in the times that we're in now with the way the economy has been over the last several years, with uh, storms that we've had pass through over the last several years that have done extensive damage to homes of various kinds and all throughout our local area and across uh, southeastern Michigan, how great of a problem has this continued to be? Has it been a growing problem in recent years? Well, coming out of the floods, I think we distributed about 150 beds just to flood victims. Uh, and most of those folks were in Dearborn, but also right here in Oakland County and Macomb as well. Um, you know, it, it, those who are most vulnerable, uh, you know, families of limited means, they are uh, at much greater risk 
uh, you know, when when crisis hits, they they generally don't have renters insurance. Um, you know, oftentimes they lose everything. If if they're getting evicted and and uh, in times of you know high inflation that we're seeing right now, that's unfortunately far too common. And and it's not as though the people have the means to get a U-Haul or or a truck to or a call on Mayflower to to help them move. And so they they lose everything. And, and that's one of the reasons why we're here. We want, you know, folks looking to rebuild their lives to have a resource and to be able to get, you know, adequate rest at night, you know, the rest that you and I take for granted. So, you know, their kids can uh, succeed in school so they can hold down a job and, and hopefully establish a career that's going to serve them and their families well. And we just are here to help give folks an opportunity to do that. And we know that in these times that can be a, a little bit more of a, of a need than it may have been in the past. And it can be tough for people to you know, maintain some of those necessities in their home or, or um, you know, replace some of those necessities in their home when various forms of damage or wear and tear happen to them. And so uh, how do, are these individuals or how are these families ultimately getting in contact with an organization like yours? If we know, if people, as we know, are out in our communities and are struggling in this regard, how can they best get, get in contact with you and maybe tap into some of these resources that you can provide them to alleviate some of these issues? So, so our main program, our Furniture for Families program, is um, works in conjunction with about 75 health and human service referral partners. And so they're, as they're trying to get them into affordable housing or perhaps get them job training or, you know, they may be working with child protective services, they will refer them over to us and we can help get them the basics, the things that they're going to need to, you know, hopefully live with, you know, stability and dignity. Um, we also here at the Furniture Bank uh, in Pontiac have a free community area. We're always putting furniture out uh, that people can take right here in Pontiac and, and surrounding us at no cost whatsoever. Um, it just uh, depends on the day and what items we're putting out. But, you know, we, we I think last year we put about 1,200 items out, uh, valued at uh, well over a million dollars for, for, well, not quite a million dollars, but probably about $250,000, excuse me, um, for folks to take it no charge. So, so there's really a couple of ways. And if they have any questions, they can call us at 248-332-1300 uh, or visit us at furniture-bank.com. Org. And on average, you uh, bring in about 1,450 pieces of furniture each month, Robert. And, and at this time, what are some of the greatest needs for your organization to meet the needs of those that you're helping in our communities? Mattresses, box springs, I mean, beds, those are always the highest demand item. Uh, dressers are always uh, in, in great need. I think we have a need for dining tables. I mean, uh, but more than anything, if you if you have a mattress and, and a box spring and or a box spring that are in good shape, we absolutely need them. Um, I think last year we gave out almost 2,000 mattresses through our Furniture for Families program. And this year I anticipate we'll, we'll probably beat that. Um, so, and if folks have furniture to donate, um, they can call us again at 248-332-1300 or visit our website, furniture-bank.org. Um, it might not look like it, but spring is uh, a little less than a month away. And uh, that's usually our busy season and the time that, you know, folks are going out to the store to get new furniture for their home. And they're blessed that they can do that. Um, so if, you, if you're able to pass that blessing along and take the items that you no longer need, if they're in good repair, there's a local family here in Southeast Michigan that could absolutely use it. So call us at 248-332-1300 or visit furniture-bank.org. And if people are considering uh, moving on from some of their furniture, from their beds, their mattresses, their box springs, and, and other items as well, what are those considerations that they should be making for those items as they're exploring ways to move them out of their home and potentially to donate them. What is that standard they should be looking out for to determine whether or not this is something that can be donated or this is something that they should uh, that they should dispose of in another method? We, we like to use the term gently used. Um, you know, for just about anything, you know, we're not able to accept it if it's uh, stained, torn, structurally damaged, has, you know, has pet damage, you know, a lot of times 
Um, you know, cats will think that a sofa is a scratching post. And, uh, you know, dogs like to spend a lot of time with their people on, on, a, on a couch if they're allowed to do so. So, so you know, we, we've had people come through with pet allergies. So we just want to make sure that the items that we are providing out are in good repair, um, are something that uh, somebody could put in their home and feel good about. Because, again, these are folks of, of limited means. Um, you know, many of them have been in, in homeless shelters or have lived for a time without furniture. And we want them to feel good about the furniture they receive so they can feel good about their home and ultimately good about themselves. So um, gently used is, is definitely the standard. We also have furniture removal services for items that maybe the dog or cat did uh, take, uh, take a little too far or, or beat up on a little bit too much. And it's one of the ways that, you know, we support our mission. We take out heavy items from people. So uh, it saves them a bad back or bump moldings. And, um, you know, it helps us do what we do and, and help about 7,000 people a year. More information can be found on their website, furniture-bank.org, furniture-bank.org, or call them 248-332-1300, 248-332-1300 for more information and ways that you can get involved and donate some of your furniture to families in need right here in our community and in our local area. Robert, before we let you go, just, just to get a, a scope on the impact that this has. You interact with these individuals, with these families all the time as they're receiving this furniture. Just how big of a, of a change is this in their life? How much does this impact someone when you donate your furniture and it goes through the Furniture Bank of Southeastern Michigan and ultimately to that individual or that family on the other side that's in, in some cases, desperate need of these items? Well, you know, uh, I, I've heard so many anecdotal stories of kids sleeping on floors uh, because they don't have a, a bed to sleep in. You know, a lot of people, they'll end up in, a, they'll be in a homeless shelter and they will be very, very excited because they're, they found affordable housing. And it, once they get into their home, um, they're, they're really unpleasantly surprised that they don't have furniture in it. And they were, they actually, in many instances, find that they were more comfortable in the shelter where they at least had a, a warm bed to, to lay their head every night. So, I mean, the impact on, on families is, is absolutely tremendous. Uh, we actually did a little study with uh, Michigan State University a, a few years back. And, um, you know, the imp there were health impacts of people who had to sleep on the floor, emotional, mental health uh, implications to, you know, having to not having an adequately furnished home. You know, people are ashamed to invite somebody into their home. I'll never forget, there was a gentleman who, uh, it was right around Thanksgiving, and he told me just how proud he was and how happy he was to be able to invite his family into his home uh, for Thanksgiving. And, and again, this is somebody who now is feeling good about his home and hopefully feeling better about himself and will get on to, you know, bigger and better things which is uh, what we want to see our clients do. More information can be found on furniture-bank.org. Robert, thank you so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure, Tyler. Thanks so much. Yeah, glad to have you on with us. Furniture-bank.org, or you can call them 248-332-1300. We'll take a break on the Megacast on the other side as we talk about some of the great work being done at homeless shelters right here in, in our local area to, to protect some of these families and provide them that shelter and that comfort that they're in need of. There's a number of different services that are provided by one of our favorite local uh, shelters, and that is Grace Centers of Hope, expanding some of their educational resources. Their Career and Education Center has expanded, and it is expanding. We'll talk next to their Career and Education Center Director, Tracy Cunningham, coming up on the Megacast. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. In the face of COVID-19, staying healthy is important. And now the same is true in the face of flu. Influenza has the power to infect millions. But it's easy to protect yourself, your family, and your community. The flu vaccine is safe and effective. 
And with COVID-19 still around, it's essential. Together, we can face flu season head on. Visit michigan.gov slash flu. It's that time of year, Greater West Bloomfield. Our towns gather together this March for the fifth annual State of the Communities. Important figures from Sylvan Lake, West Bloomfield, Orchard Lake, and Kego Harbor discuss the past year's projects and developments. Hear presentations from speakers, discussions on plans of action, and more. The fifth annual State of the Communities, March 13th at 7 p.m. at the new West Bloomfield Middle School. Many people are feeling overwhelmed and struggling with mental wellness these days. So be kind to your mind. Give yourself permission to breathe. Share your feelings. You are not alone. Have hope. Talk to a Stay Well counselor for free confidential help 24-7 through the COVID-19 hotline. Ronnie started doing prescription pills at the age of 15, and by 19, he died. If your child is struggling with drug use, try not to be too proud to reach out for help. Don't be worried about what the neighbor will think or your family. Just get your child the help they need. Sometimes it's the hard road to take, but um, the hard road is nothing compared to living with the fact that your child is no longer with you. There's hope and help at drugfree.org. Welcome back to the MechaCast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. You can learn more about our program on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, as well as link, find links to each and every one of our partnering TV, radio, and web outlets that join us every day, live from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., as well as live to tape throughout the mornings, afternoons, evenings, and weekends. And find us on demand so you can watch us on your time as well. civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Joining us now on the program is Tracy Cunningham, the Career and Education, Education Center Director at Grace Centers of Hope. Tracy, thanks for being with us today and, and this exciting time at Grace Centers of Hope. Yes, good morning. Thank you for having me, Tyler. Yeah, glad to have you on as uh, your Career and Education Center uh, is now expanding or, has, or you just announced an expansion of the center. First off, tell us a little bit about the Career and Education Center and then how this expansion will help provide those services at an even greater scale than before. Sure, we currently had our current and education um, building and we served those that were looking for their GED. And uh, we just graduated our 50th GED student about two years ago. So I think we have 52 or 54 now. Um, so that's exciting. And then we also do what we call transition and job search and job readiness programs. Uh, so that's where once they finish the program, we help them to actually find a job that they're suited for, um, help them to get back out into the world of working after being in the program for a year. Um, so we try to make sure that it's a good fit and that it works for their schedules, especially if they have kids uh, and other things that they need to work around. So that's what our career and education center has done in the past. That's what we mostly worked on, but what we decided uh, last May was that we needed to expand it and now do a program for uh, the men right now because it's a pilot program, uh, but for the men right now and start to teach actual life skills, um, science, math, reading and writing especially, talking about uh, their social skills, talking about job etiquette. So we decided to expand the building and we've created three different classrooms. We've we took our unfinished basement, you know, we just had a regular Michigan unfinished basement and we redid the entire thing. All of the work was done by men who either are in the program or have gone through the program and work now on our maintenance team. Um, and all of the work has been done by them. So they did an amazing job. We have three new classrooms. We have a lounge area. Uh, we, have a, we have a coffee bar down there for the guys to just grab a coffee, sit and relax for a little bit if they need to. Um, my office is down there now, so we've really created this amazing space for learning. Our three classrooms each have their own function. One is for lectures, uh, teaching, discussions, 
Another is what I call the science lab. So that's where we're gonna do our science activities. We're gonna have a lot of hands-on activities in there. We're gonna be looking at different hobbies to do. Um, and then our third is our computer and our, our computer lab and our library. So we're also looking at working on you know, Microsoft products, figuring out how does Microsoft Word work? How do I open a document, write a document, save it? Same thing with Excel, PowerPoint. These are all things that our men and our women too eventually, but our men uh, especially need to be able to know before they go out into the working world. We want them to have these skills and be able to move forward with uh, hopefully eventually finding a career that they enjoy and they want to have a li live a very healthy, happy, successful recovery life. And so all of this that we do here is trying to help to feed into that for them. And so these expan this, the expansion, of course, it's more space, it's, it's better facilities to be able to run these classes and provide these different services and these uh, different skills training too, but it also, I would imagine, allows you to do a little bit more at any given time and, and provide more to each and every one of these people that are in your program at Grace Centers of Hope. So just how much of, a, of an impact can that have that, to have that expanded space and be able to do a little bit more at each given time or a little bit more overall instead of trying to you know fit that all into a given space that you have that maybe wasn't most conducive to learning previously absolutely this place has been dynamic in offering a place for them to come kind of get out of their living space which is the mission where they live get out of their living space and open up their minds to new opportunities we didn't have a place where we could do that before. And that's what we can do now. A lot of times what happens is when someone comes to us, they are they are broken, they are hurting, they are in need of some emotional healing, some spiritual healing. And what, what I try to do here with the Life Skills Program is give them the steps and the tools to know how to move forward. How do you move forward in recovery? And this place opens up a whole new area for them to come and, and to learn those things. Many people, we talk about this all the time, a lot of times the drug abuse, the homelessness, it's generational. So how do we stop that? How do we work on that? How do we learn from our past and move forward in a healthy, positive way? How can we come better more responsible citizens. And this this opportunity, this space that we've opened up here gives every single one of our male residents right now an opportunity to come over and be able to figure that out. We yeah. didn't have that before. We didn't have the ability to be able to do that. So this is, it's incredible. More information can be found on programs through Grace Centers of Hope and their website, gracecentersofhope.org or you can call them at 1-855-HELP-GCH, 1-855-HELP-GCH for more information. And we're joined on today's program by Tracy Cunningham, the Career and Education Center Director at Grace Centers of Hope as they've now expanded their Career and Education Center and are able to provide even more services, more classes and skills training to individuals all throughout our local area. If you're watching on our TV or on our streams, you can see on the screen some of these different uh, classes that are being conducted at the Career and Education Center, the new facilities, the renovations, some before and after uh, shots as we've gone through these pictures today. And it really is, uh, it really is quite amazing how great uh, of a space they have there at Grace Centers of Hope now. And so Tracy, as you're uh, considering this project and as it's being planned and ultimately executed, uh, how did this all come about? Where did it start? And ultimately, where did uh, the, the funding then come from to put in this effort and ultimately provide even greater space and even more services to those that you're serving at Grace Centers of Hope. Yeah, I think that we we found that the need was there to talk to them about those baby steps. What are those baby steps? How do we actually how do we actually move forward in recovery? And we had a couple of donors who came alongside of us and said, "Let me help." I, I want to be able to give you the finances to be able to create this space. So we were able to have some donors who gave the funds to us to be able to do that. Again, we also had um, the team here at Grace Centers who was able to actually put in the work and make that happen. So those were um, absolutely crucial in keeping our program going. And I did wanna mention, of course, if 
if anyone is interested in finding out more, they can always contact me at Grace Centers of Hope. Um, my, my email address is on the website. And if they're interested in donating, they can contact me also. I would love to have people come in, take a tour of the place, see what we're actually about. More information can be found on gracecentersofhope.org. Gracecentersofhope.org for more information. And in terms of these programs, Tracy, you've seen it in your time at Grace Centers of Hope, just how much of a change this sort of education, these sort of career training opportunities can have on somebody when they go through the program at Grace Centers of Hope, after they've gone through the program at Grace Centers of Hope, and over the years beyond that as well, just how big of an impact do these programs ultimately have on these individuals you're treating at Grace Centers of Hope? Oh, huge, monumental impacts. So many of them do actually change that generational pattern because they learn that it doesn't have to be that way. So I don't think you could ever measure the success of the program because there are so many just minute things that happen just to change the thought process, to change um, their relationships with their children, to change their relationships with their parents, with their family, to go on to work and actually have a career and not just worry about the day-to-day -day, um, working and day-to-day -day making sure that you have enough money. They actually, come to a place where they can get all of their needs are met here. We have, not only do they have a place to sleep and do they have food and shelter, but they have case managers who work with them. We have a daycare center, so if they have kids with them, they're offered uh, free daycare. We have um, the aftercare program. So if they choose to stay with us after a full year for another couple of years, they can still live in our community. It provides accountability, which is absolutely monumental when you're talking about recovery. So the impact that Gray Centers of Hope makes, I don't know that you could ever measure it. I do know that since we've started this program with the men in the life skills classes, every day I hear, thank you, I needed to hear that. Thank you, that makes a difference. I'm going to change how I think. I'm going to change how I make decisions. That alone is a huge impact right there. You can find more information and ways that you can get involved at gracecentersofhope.org. Gracecentersofhope.org or give them a call 1-855-HELP-GCH. 1-855-HELP-GCH for more information. Tracy, before we let you go, anything else we should know about the Career and Educational Center at Grace Centers of Hope that we haven't discussed yet today? Just like I said, if you want to come in and have a tour, we would love to show everybody around. If you're interested in tutoring some of our GED um, clients, absolutely give me a call. Like I said, you can contact me from the website. We also have the opportunity for those that want to come in and teach classes or maybe just share a skill or a trade with our men's program. I'm working on getting those things scheduled and getting people to come in and share those that information with, with our guys. So if you want to contact us for that, Go ahead, give me an email, give me a give me a call, and I would love to to set you up for that. Gracecentersofhope.org. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tyler. Appreciate it. Gracecentersofhope.org or call them 1-855-HELP-GCH. That is going to do it for today's edition of the MegaCast. You can always stay up to date with us as well as our partnering stations across Oakland County and around the state of Michigan on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Big thank you to each one of our guests today for joining us, Carrie Krawick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic, Robert Boyle from the Furniture Bank of Southeastern Michigan, and of course, Tracy Cunningham from Grace Centers of Hope in Pontiac. Again, you can find all those interviews on demand this afternoon on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Huge thanks as well to our crew at the studio of My Michigan TV, Jared Clark, and directing our program today at Master Control at Civic Center TV, Calvin Brown. That's our show for this Thursday. We'll return soon with a new episode. Take care of each other, and we'll see you soon.